When something really good happens to us, it's easy to share it, isn't it? In fact, you can't wait to deliver the news to someone you really care about. Well, what if you could learn how to tell someone else about the amazing love of God in the same non-threatening, natural way? Well, today that's what we're going to learn how to do. Stay with me. Thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. Living on the Edge is an international discipleship ministry motivating Christians to live like Christians. And in just a minute, Chip continues our series, Share the Love, by giving us a behind-the-scenes look at his faith journey. Along the way, he'll outline some practical steps to help us share our story with anyone we meet. There's a lot to get to, so if you have a Bible handy, go to the Book of Acts, Chapter 26, for the second half of Chip's talk, Share His Love Through Your Story. So let me just take a moment, and I'll share my story using this outline, okay? You've probably heard parts of it here and there, but if I was sitting down and we had a cup of coffee and I said, hey, where'd you grow up? And you told me where you grew up. And so what was it like growing up? And you told me a little bit about your family and this and that. And then just normal or casually, you might say, well, Chip, tell me a little bit about your life. Externally, what I'd say is, well, I grew up in a home. Parents were school teachers and we were in general kind of pretty, pretty moral. Uh, My mom was an amazing person, a guidance counselor. My dad, you know, ex-Marine, Guam, Iwo Jima, science teacher. Uh, he was a great athlete, so I was really, you know, pushed and admired and wanted to be a good athlete. And uh, my dad was one of those guys that uh, I never heard him say, I love you, uh, until uh, late in his life. Uh, I never, he wasn't a hugger, but um, I knew he loved me. And the way he loved me was, uh, in that generation, is he would help you become successful. If you did really well, that's the way you got loved. And So he'd hit grounders until they would bounce off my face. And if I got four A's and a B, we had a deep talk about what happened with the B. And um, it was real, I mean, that was his love language. It was, I really want you to do well, because I learned in my house early that uh, if there's a theme, it was, if you can become successful, then you'll really be happy. And I want to help you be successful. And the way you're successful is this, it's real easy, you know? Uh, You get up earlier than everybody else, you set very clear goals, you develop a strategy to get there, and when they're sleeping, you work. And when they go to bed, you keep working. And I'll tell you what, son, you'll be successful, and when you're successful, you'll be happy. And so I became a workaholic by the time I was 13. I had six or seven yards, three paper routes at one time. I lent my parents uh, $3,000 when I was 13 years old at 6% interest. I decided, I I read an article about Pete Maravich when I was uh, about seventh grade, and I saw all the drills that he did and started doing those drills for about eight or nine hours a day and decided I'm going to date a pretty cheerleader. I'm going to get a basketball scholarship. I'm going to graduate in the top of my class. I'm going to be in this club and be all league and this and that. And, uh, And I went like an absolute wild man after that. I didn't do any drugs. I didn't do any alcohol. I was too busy. But internally, I was desperately insecure. I was very short and very skinny. Uh, So I had that little chip on my shoulder trying to prove myself. I was very mouthy, very arrogant, had a real foul mouth. And I was really lonely inside because my dad began to drink more and more and more as I got older. And uh, I just had a big wound I didn't know about. But that's what my life was like. So uh, the realization of my need came the night that I graduated from high school. I vividly remember sitting in an empty apartment off Ohio State's campus with about 25 or 30 people. And as a, in that, those days, they called it a reefer, a joint, whatever you call it. But they were passing it around, and we were telling stories about high school. And as it came around, a gal named Jackie turned to me and said, you must be very happy tonight. And she was one of those girls that was a friend, and we were in a lot of study halls together, and we talked honestly. And I remember turning and saying, well, why do you say that? And because we talked, she goes, well, you know, you did well in school. You date that cute little cheerleader. You got a scholarship. And she named a few things. And I didn't realize, see, every single person pursues something or someone that you believe is going to make you happy. Everyone behaves in a way that makes sense to them. Even if you don't articulate it, even if you don't think it through, your behavior, your energy, your time, your money, it all, I mean, if you could put it all together, all of us go towards something that makes sense. I didn't realize the mantra was, if you work hard and successful, you'll be happy. And when she said that, it was like a light came on. And I didn't feel happy, I felt empty. 
because I'd already decided the next set of goals. I've already decided I'm going to major in political science. I'll be a lawyer. I'll be very rich. I'm going to marry a beautiful girl. I will have a luxury car, a station wagon, an Irish setter, three beautiful kids. Uh, by age 35, I'll be a leader in the community. I mean, and, and thank, you know, my dad, he was an alcoholic, and he may have sort of warped me a little bit, but I had this amazing mother, and they, they produced this child with a very high self-esteem. <laughs> I mean, arrogant self-esteem. I grew up with someone who told you, you, don't worry about failing, just get up and try it again. And if you keep going, you'll, you'll, you'll always. And I, that night I realized I had 15 years and I do the next set of goals and my life will be maybe 10 times more empty than it is right now. So I drove harm, home and uh, looked at the stars And I had given up on organized religion because all the Christians I met were phony. And um, it wasn't a church that taught God's word. And I was disillusioned with God and disillusioned with people. But I looked at the stars and said, if there is a God, reveal yourself to me. Because, I mean, please take this. This is my actual prayer. It's not like I'm cussing in church, but this was my prayer. My dad was a science teacher. There must be some designer behind all this design of all these stars, and I've heard about God, but I don't know if you exist. But if you exist, and if you're big enough to reveal yourself to me in a way that I can understand, and you actually created me, I will do whatever you want. If you don't exist, or if you're not big enough to reveal yourself in a way that makes sense, I'm going to live like hell, and I'm going to die young, and I'm going to squeeze as much fun. I'm tired of just being sort of a, a, a moral person out of some code that doesn't make any sense. Uh, Within a week, uh, I was uh, told by the guy I was going to start my summer job that the job was delayed a week. We were going to paint a house. Next day, the football coach said, I'd like to send you to this camp. I'll pay your way. It's called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. There's 600 of the best high school basketball players from Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia. Sports sounded good. Someone's going to pay your way. I went, and then it was like, what have I done? This is how I met Christ. Um, What caused me to consider a solution was I was desperately lonely, insecure, and my performance orientation of no matter what you do doesn't measure up. And I'm starting to learn success doesn't necessarily equal happiness. I I land, and there's 600 guys, and they gave me a Bible. It said, good news for modern man. And I'd never read the Bible before. And then they gave me a T-shirt with a cross on it. And I heard, like, in the first 20 minutes, people say Jesus' name, like, out loud, like he was a real person. And I thought, I have been dropped into the land of Jesus freaks. What have I done? It's 1972. They're going to indoctrinate me. These are the weird people. I've read about these people. They're weird. I want to play basketball, but this is nuts. For the first two days, I didn't open my Bible. I refused to do any of the religious stuff they did. But every morning, uh, after some workouts, a guy would read a paragraph from the Bible and explain it, and it actually made sense in words you could understand. The biggest thing was I got exposure to God's Word. I saw people in my world, Christians were weak, anti-intellectual, people that need a crutch, and mostly uh, women. I never saw any masculine, strong person that I would ever, ever want to be like and had the word Christian or Jesus in the same sentence. And now I'm working out with guys that are pro athletes and college athletes and high school athletes from all over. And I, and I, I respected them. I heard Tom Landry share his testimony But the big moment for me was I remember after about four days and realizing, because I I thought they're faking it. This must be a big act for two or three days. No one can be this kind and loving. And I remember two guys walking off a a grass uh, workout field. We'd been working out all day and can still remember the green shorts. He was a wide receiver for the Atlanta Falcons. And he was walking with the fullback from Illinois. And uh, I was this skinny, maybe 135, 138 pounds, just skinny little white kid uh, who was a basketball Jones trying to do what I wanted to do. And I'm about 10 feet behind him. I can hear parts of the conversation. And this wide receiver, big guy, put his hand on the shoulder. And I heard a conversation between a grown man and a grown man that expressed deep, intimate 
love for one another that was masculine. And I'd never seen it before in my life. I didn't know the verse that said that I would know that Jesus came from God because Christians love one another. You've been listening to Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram, and we'll get you back to the remainder of his message in just a minute. But before we do, has someone special in your life walked away from God or remains intensely opposed to the Bible? Then keep listening after the teaching to learn about a resource we have that'll explain how to skillfully and intentionally share the truth of the gospel in this post-Christian culture. Stick around for more details. Okay, let's get back to our series, Share the Love. Later on, that fullback would sing the Lord's Prayer the very last night. And I didn't even know what was happening. Uh, I, I had never opened anything, but after watching that, I finally gave in. And so I decided on one of the mornings, every morning, you were to read your Bible for like 10 minutes. And so I opened the Bible for the very first time. And you all will get a kick out of this, knowing me now. These are the first words I ever read. Good news. I urge you, therefore, my dear friends, in view of God's wonderful kindness and grace to you, that you should offer your body as a living sacrifice to him. This is what God really wants from you. Don't be conformed or molded any longer to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that your life and how you really live would demonstrate what God's will looks like, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. And through the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think is to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Does that sound familiar? It's the first time I ever read the Bible, and it was like a video camera went on. And I could see me acting tough in the locker room and cussing, and then I could see me acting like the all-American boy with teachers and acting sweet with girls. And, and I just, this, you know, it was like this videotape of this phony person that I hated, always trying to figure out what to give different groups, seeing this, this chameleon socially and this manipulator who was desperately insecure and longing for love, and for the first time ever, someone put their finger on it. And he sang the Lord's Prayer that night, and when he got done singing the Lord's Prayer, because he was the same guy I heard talking to that wide receiver, a guy got up and drew a picture with some chalk, and he said that God loved me. And after he told me that God loved me, he said he proved it by sending Jesus his son. And after he drew this picture of Jesus, his son, somehow he made this picture of a tomb, and with the lighting, it opened up, and he talked about that this Jesus rose from the dead, and that he would offer me peace and life and forgiveness, and that he was standing at the door knocking at my heart, Revelation 3.20. And if I would open the door of my life and my heart, Jesus would actually come into my life in the person of the Holy Spirit, forgive me forever, seal me with his spirit, give new direction and purpose to my life and make me heaven bound. And I, I prayed a prayer that I wasn't theologically very smart or sound, but I said, God, I don't get it all, but here's what I know. Whatever it means for you to come into my life, forgive me of my sin, that's what I want more than anything else. So will you come in? And that's what happened in my life. I change that happened was uh, I went home and Lest my parents, who uh, were, were not that they would be super opposed, but we, religion in my family was we, we didn't pray together, we didn't talk about it. As my dad would say later, even when he was drunk, he went to church. You know, you just did it, you know? And uh, so I took this little Bible they gave me and I hid it underneath my pillow. And uh, in the morning when I got up, it was just like, wow, I had this, this hunger for it. I'd read it. And then before I went to bed, I'd turn on a little light and I'd read it. And, and it was like, how could anybody know this about you? And I, would, I just read through the New Testament. And there was this something that happened that, that I can't explain externally. And in about 10 days to two weeks, my tongue, something happened. Because I, I cussed worse than a sailor. And all of a sudden, I didn't, I didn't, it, I mean, that was just one of external things. I didn't cuss anymore. I thought, where did that go? And then I'll never forget my desires changed externally. And I just turned 18 and the laws had just changed so you could go hang out in bars and you're 18 years old and you know, I've read the Bible now like for five days. And so the guys, come on, guys, let's go. And so we hit some very sleazy bar. And I'll still remember myself and another guy here and one of my other friends here. And then a very ill-clad lady in this very sleazy bar um, sitting next to him. And 
I remember looking around this place that I'd never been in, and I just, something came over me inside that I couldn't explain. I mean, man, we can drink now, we can come to places like this, and man, we can party, and this is, and all I can tell you is, it, it was like, this is dirty. This, I mean, I don't, this is, it, it's like I just wanted, and I remember getting up and going, guys, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut, I'm going to, I got to chill, I got to get out of here. Man, come on, man, you know, have another. I said, you know, I, I don't understand it. I just... And I remember walking out that door and getting in my little green Volkswagen and driving away and thinking, I have no idea what's going on. But I mean, three weeks ago, I'd have been, and I don't want to be near it. And God began to he changed me from the inside out. Now, internally, you talk about continued struggles. Um, uh, I, uh, I had plenty of them, but I had peace. I had a sense of forgiveness, and probably the greatest gift for me was I didn't have to pretend. Someone loved me and forgave me. I could be chip, the same chip with the girl, the same chip with my family, the same chip in the locker room. It was freedom. I didn't know the verse that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. All I knew was it was just like the entire weight of the world was off my shoulders. Now, I'd love to say that I, from that moment on, have never felt like I had to perform to earn the favor or please people. In fact, uh, the, the good part about beginning to read the Bible was as transformational. The bad part was if you would have asked me two weeks before I trusted Christ, are you a good person? 99 percentile. I've never killed anyone, right? I live in America. I vaguely believe there must be a God. You know, I don't drink. I don't smoke. Don't do drugs. I mean, I, there's, you know, Mother Teresa, and I'm a little below her, but I mean, literally, I mean, I just... And then I started to read the scriptures and I realized how sinful, how selfish, how manipulative, how lustful. I began to realize that all my sin had to do with stuff inside my head and it was despicable in God's eyes. But that he loved me and that he forgave me. That's my story. Now I can tell that in about three minutes. I can tell it in about 11 like I just did. And here's what, you know what? It's not real dramatic, but it's mine. And I'm a trophy of God's grace. And I've shared that story thousands of times in the last 30 years. And I've seen scores of people who for some reason made a connection with my story and realized my little story was a bridge between this ocean of God's love, the person of Christ, and their need. What would happen if each one of us would say, Lord, I commit 30 or 45 minutes or an hour, and I'm going to outline my story at least, or I'm going to write it out, and I'm going to be prepared. I mean, how long did it take me to to read Paul's story? Four minutes? What if you wrote yours out, and then it was ready? And then what you'll find is the Spirit of God, people will ask you questions that will lead to your story. And, And you know what? It's not preachy. It's just your story. Let me just give you some very specific tips. Number one, develop a theme. The central issue in your life that shows the contrast in your spiritual outlook before Christ and then after. Uh, my, my theme, uh, very interestingly, is that whole success equals happiness. When I sit down and talk with people, now, when I'm playing hoop and sitting like I did yesterday and talk with someone, I use the basketball illustrations. When I'm sitting with an executive and we're kicking stuff around, I talk about work, my workaholism in my work. But both of those are my story, but the theme's the same. Second, outline, keep it clear and simple. Just keep it clear and simple. The power is in what God has done. Third, end with the question or statement that requires a response. You know, the Apostle Paul said, King Agrippa, you believe in the prophets, don't you? I'll I'll often share when I get done with my story. So what do you think? Have you ever investigated the Bible? I'm often way more committed to someone saying, you know what, I'd read the book of John with you. Want to kick that around? Than I am them, I've never heard anything about God, and I'm going to pray a prayer. You just need to be discerning, but just ask him, would you like to explore? That's my story. Would you like to explore God's story for you? Fourth, uh, scripture, think of one verse that opened your eyes and share how it impacted you. Uh, Revelation 3.20 for me was just like, you're, I mean, forgive this, but you're kidding me. God lives inside of you? Whoa. I mean, I just couldn't, what? He will come in? Length, be brief and to the point. 
You can always share more, but write it out where you can share it briefly. Attitude, share, don't preach. Okay, just, it's your heart. You don't have to convince. You don't, it's not your job. Just, this is what God did in me. This is where I was. This is how I met him. Here's what's changed. Sensitivity, focus on the other person and share aspects of your life that relate to their interests and needs. As you get better and share it more and more, you'll just find that there's a lot to your story, isn't there? And you can pull from this part of your story or that part of your story, but just be sensitive and, and share the parts of your story that connect with what's going on in their life. And then finally, focus. Make Jesus the star of your story. I've at times heard a story of a testimony, and 90% of it, this is my life before. And it's kind of like, you know, in, in the name of sharing Christ, you hear all this stuff that you're really not sure you want to hear that much. And, and then pretty soon, the, the person is the star of the story. The star of your story is the Son of God. The star of your story is his love and forgiveness. The star of your story is that whether you came out of a great environment or a very difficult environment, he's the savior of the world, and he's your friend, and he's God. And he's done that for you, and he longs to do that for the person you're talking to. And so let me encourage you, um, would you be willing this week to block off 45 minutes and write your story? And then would you be willing just to say, I've got it, Lord. If you'll open the door, I will naturally, lovingly share my story with the person as you lead me. You're listening to Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. And the message you just heard, Share His Love Through Your Story, is from our series, Share the Love. Chip will be back to share some insights from today's talk in just a minute. For one reason or another, many Christians today are hesitant to share their faith. We know we should, but when the opportunity comes, we get nervous or insecure to follow through. Well, why is that, and how can we change it? In this eight-part series, Chip's going to boost our confidence and teach us how to have intentional, easy conversations about Jesus. Discover the heart, skills, and perspective to naturally share your faith. For more information about Share the Love or our resources, visit livingontheedge.org. That's livingontheedge.org. Well, Chip's back with me in studio, and Chip, we've seen an incredible response to this new book we've helped create with our friend Aaron Pierce called Not Beyond Reach. And this resource, unlike any other we've produced, highlights a serious issue we as believers must address. Would you take a few minutes and talk a bit more about that? Absolutely, Dave. I just have to say, uh, I've been involved for the last five years with the church filled with millennials and Gen Zs. I've had them in our home. We've had discussions. And I just have to tell you, I'm deeply concerned about young people. Uh, More personally, like most people listening, I'm most deeply concerned about the young people closest to me, my kids, my grandkids. And I'm meeting moms and dads here and across the country who all keep telling me the same story. Uh, My kids are drifting away from the Lord. I don't know what to do. I don't have a plan. I don't understand where they're coming from. And what I can tell you is this brand new book by Aaron Pierce that we've worked on together will give you a map, a blueprint, a game plan to not just connect with your kids or grandkids, but to really understand them and connect them more importantly with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't emphasize enough how important it is. Get this book, get educated, then put it into practice. Thanks, Chip. To get your hands on this book, Not Beyond Reach, visit livingontheedge.org or the Chip Ingram app. Discover the simple process you can follow to share the gospel with those who question or outright reject Jesus. Place your order for this insightful new book, Not Beyond Reach, by going to livingontheedge.org or the Chip Ingram app. Well, Chip, you wrapped up your message today by challenging us to set aside time to write out our story. But for those who may have missed it, would you quickly recap what we should include? Absolutely, Dave. This is what I want people to get. Mm -hmm. There's a very simple three-point outline. It's what the Apostle Paul used. Uh, Point number one, what was your life like before you met Christ? Don't spend too much time there, but specifically write out, this is what my life was like before I met Christ. This is how I thought. This is what I did. This was the kind of home. Give people a snapshot of your life. Second, 
how did you actually encounter Christ? I mean, your actual prayer. Tell people, this is where I was. Uh, this is what I was thinking. This is what I actually prayed. And I want you to just write this out. It'll take you about 45 minutes, and it may sound like a big assignment, but believe me, it'll, it'll fly by. And then third, since I trusted Christ as my Savior, this is how my life changed. Now, again, everything isn't perfect. Uh, you have good days. You have rough days. But God has been faithful. Begin to write down how has your life changed internally what's happened, your thoughts, your emotions, your hopes, externally what's happened, relationships, or, you know, maybe any moral issues that there was a clean break with there. God has worked in your life. And, and since I've taught this before, can I give you just a, a little word of encouragement? Uh, I've had a number of people write me and say, you know, I've never really shared my faith. I took 45 minutes. I wrote it out. I've never shared it much. And then out of the blue, God gave this opportunity, and I, I shared it, but I never would have if I wasn't prepared. And then they said, I think God gave me the opportunity because now I'm prepared. Can you imagine someone's eternity being changed forever and ever because you take 45 minutes and get clear about how to share your story and then watch and see if God doesn't bring someone into your life? Now go for it. Great challenge, Chip. Thanks. As we close, I want to thank each of you who makes this program possible through your generous giving. 100% of your gifts go directly to the ministry to help Christians live like Christians. Now, if you found this teaching helpful but aren't yet on the team, consider doing that today. Sending a gift is easy. Go to livingontheedge.org or call us at 888-333-6003. That's 888 or visit livingontheedge.org. Dot org. App listeners, tap donate. And let me thank you in advance for doing whatever the Lord leads you to do. Well, until next time, this is Dave Drury saying thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like to watch more content like this, click and subscribe here to our channel. And by the way, if you'd like to know more about Living on the Edge, find out about more resources, maybe get on the mailing list, go to livingontheedge.org. See you next time.